Welcome to Analysis and Chains with Nathan and Neil. Happy Monday, everybody. Nathan here. Hi, Neil. How are you doing? All's good, Nathan. All's good. The snow has started to fall in Montreal. So, uh, oh my gosh. Yeah, we're supposed to have a uh, classic Canadian winter. So, I'm um, getting ready, going to the shops, buying as much furry, woolly clothes as possible, and uh, getting ready to uh, hibernate. I was, I was back in Montreal for Christmas last year, and I remember the air hurting my face. And thinking to myself, why did I come to a place where the air hurts my face? That's the stupidest thing I could do. Yeah. So I'm very happy here. It's quite quite mild. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good to hear. Good to hear. But uh, I think what will keep me warm at night is uh, the sight of my portfolio growing in the in crypto land because in the last few weeks all crypto have really taken off. It's been uh, an interesting. Uh, period which one is your favorite at this point neil i i think i think the, the one that i find the most interesting is still bitcoin cash more because it's uh it's a threat to to bitcoin or it's, it's trying to to um to to be a threat to bitcoin it, it's definitely creating a lot of buzz i know a lot of people are kind of anti-bitcoin cash but at the same time it's uh, it's fascinating because Bitcoin is this this big cheese is the big main cryptocurrency that the whole world knows about, and to think that some other cryptocurrency could come along and take its crown is is definitely a very interesting narrative. I do love seeing this whole aspect because it's it's impossible to know who's going to win, and uh, it's really a wild west situation. Yeah, like I think what's been the most interesting thing in the last week has been Bitcoin hitting 9,000. It's over 9,000. Oh, wow. Over 9,000. And, you know, many believe it will hit 10K by the end of the year. And I, I think there's every chance that that will happen. And what, what makes it so interesting is that while Bitcoin's getting higher, the threats are also growing at the same time. So I'm sure there are many people out there, you know, getting FOMO, thinking, oh, I should have invested this time last year. If I did that, I would have had a 10x return. But the thing is that, you know, the risks and the threats are increasing. And so 2018 could be very interesting because if, if Bitcoin can get through these growing threats are coming the next month, yeah, it can go to, it, it could hit the moon. But if it cannot weather the storm that's coming, it could really have a difficult 2018. One thing I find absolutely interesting about the price of Bitcoin potentially hitting 10,000 is because if it does that, then one Satoshi will be equal to one cent. Wow. Right. So, yeah, that that's the point where the the value of the smallest division of Bitcoin, the Satoshi, the smallest amount you can divide a Bitcoin into is equal to the smallest amount that you can divide a, a U.S. dollar into. And um, if it, uh, when it goes beyond that, then it, it, you'll have trouble making an argument that it's really meant to be a cash substitute or a decentralized payment substitute. Because once the Satoshi is beyond one cent uh, in value, how do you use it to start to, uh, to make transactions, like smaller transactions? It really does move into the the realm of uh, investment only at that point. Is Bitcoin an investment or is it a medium of transaction? And this is the debate that's been growing more and more. And, and particularly with increased transaction costs, it's like, okay, you know, you have a transaction cost, well, you're investing in something and people put maybe $10,000 into Bitcoin. And so that transaction cost isn't that big of a percentage. But then are we moving away from the point of Bitcoin? Was it, is it supposed to be an investment vehicle or is it just supposed to be um, a form of sovereign wealth that it was seen as when it first started? So I think, I think that these ideologies, as we've touched on in the past, are really starting to uh, come into battle against each other. And 
I think this is where we're going to have to let the market decide because the, the threats that are coming up in the next few weeks can really determine if this ideology really is the right way forward for Bitcoin. Because what we what we will see coming is the CME future contracts. So that's where we'll see institutional investors um, have a role in determining Bitcoin price because at the moment, the only way to play the game is to buy and hold, whereas it's very difficult to short a Bitcoin. And the other thing that will make it very interesting is that the difficulty is due to increase in the next coming weeks. And when that happens, that could play, um, that could be greatly impact the, uh, the amount of miners who partake in the Bitcoin network. Because if the difficulty increases, and becomes less pro- less profitable to mine Bitcoin, you can see them switch over to Bitcoin Cash, which is already more profitable, but the profitability would increase uh, because of the new difficulty algorithm that Bitcoin Cash has in place. Just to uh, clarify, Neil, when you're talking about the difficulty increasing, you're talking about the hash difficulty, right? The difficulty yeah. in mining and forming a new block? Exactly, exactly. So, so theoretically... Uh, and this is what uh, many people are saying on the forums and on YouTube. They're saying that th- with this increase in difficulty, it could impact the profitability, which could mean that a lot of miners could move from Bitcoin to Bitcoin Cash. Therefore, the hash rate would change and we could see the Bitcoin network freeze up like we saw, I think, three weeks ago, which could really screw up Bitcoin and any... Um, I guess, uh, any desirability to invest in it and see it as a form of investment. So that's why it's going to be very, very interesting to see, you know, can this, uh, you know, can this ideology stand, stand or get, get through these threats? Um, because it, effectively, if we see these change happen, it could suggest that the market prefers the ideology of cash or, or acting as a medium of exchange and sovereign wealth as opposed to being, uh, a form of investment. Do you know why they're uh, they're increasing the uh, the difficulty for the for the block mining? I, I believe it's due. I believe it's based a uh, Bitcoin. Oh, it's a scheduled uh, yeah, a schedule. It, yeah. So, but Bitcoin difficulty is based on how many blocks that pass, whereas the Bitcoin Cash difficulty uh, is based on the algorithm, and it's really hmm. to the advantage of Bitcoin cash miners to make it profitable and to make it in their interest to maintain the network. Uh, I guess that, uh, that makes sense. The more the more blocks that have passed, theoretically, the more Bitcoins are out there and the more people that will be mining them. And so in order to keep the, the block time to approximately 10 minutes, uh, they've got to increase it. But I guess they didn't count on a whole pile of people forking off and going to, uh, to Bitcoin cash. Exactly. Exactly. And then... You're, you're bringing me to the other threat, uh, and I'm sure many people have noticed on Coin Market Cap, there's a new entrant at number five, which is Bitcoin Gold, which we uh, well, we knew about this. Um, for, <laughs> Who would have thought? Yeah, <laughs> like we all knew about this fork a few weeks ago, but it, it kind of takes a while for um, new currencies and tokens to to end up on Coin Market Cap, and it's not until they're actually there on the list and have some movement in the market, they start to realize, wow, this is actually a big currency. And the fact that uh, a fork like Bitcoin Gold that was ridiculed can be so high up really makes you wonder, okay, well, you know, I guess it's in other people's interest to continue to fork Bitcoin because it's just, it's it's nearly, nearly a guaranteed top 10 currency with a huge amount of value. And uh, I think that's another threat to Bitcoin. We could see this happen more in 2018 that could really undermine um, it as a currency. It's funny because we talked a couple of weeks ago about how the number of ICOs has doubled, but the value going into all of these ICOs has you know, plummeted. Uh, and it seems that uh, just with this new development that, yes, it, it, it looks like rather than creating your own cryptocurrency, the way to fast cash is just to fork the Bitcoin chain. Exactly. And um, whether long term, obviously, this is not sustainable, but uh, whether this creates another fork bubble 
uh, I could definitely see that happening as as the excitement sort of mounts in that direction. Yeah, exactly. I agree. And the thing about cryptocurrencies is that we're playing with money. We're playing with capital. And when yeah, it's about $100 billion. <laughs> yeah. And the thing is, when Bitcoin started off, it really was an ideology. And the, the amount of capital in it was not that huge. But now we're, we're in a world where people just see money. They just see return on investment. They just see opportunity. And we, we're starting to see a lot of these ideologies erode. And this is what makes it so difficult to... Um, I guess for many people out there to to take cryptocurrency seriously is because it's still trying to find itself. You know, what, what, what are we trying to establish here? Are we trying to make money out of thin air? Are we trying to get rich? Or are we trying to come up with a, a better alternative to fiat and other existing systems that are out there? Um, every time you fork a, a cryptocurrency, you're making money out of thin air. And this goes against the argument that central banks are printing money and then you lose all of these people who uh, who you want to bring into Bitcoin are, are you know it's, it becomes pointless to them because they, they think this is a huge Ponzi scheme there is uh, this a similar effect of the more people that join the more the value goes up and as people get excited about this, the they join well, the reason that we've hit 9000 with uh, with bitcoin is partly because there were 100,000 people that that joined in one of the big exchanges last week and you know when there's a flood of new money there's, there's a flood of demand and there's not a lot of liquidity in the bitcoin market so uh, i don't think it's exactly the same it's not like a ponzi scheme but what we haven't seen yet is a stabilization of the market. And I don't see it on the horizon with the institutional investors poised to come in. I mean, there's a lot of value in the Bitcoin chain. There's about $100 billion of value, but that's a small hedge fund's worth, right? And when people come in and they're like, okay, well, we want to short Bitcoin or we want to invest, you know, a, a few hedge funds worth of money into crypto, well, that's when we're going to see real instability come in. I think uh, it, it could go right to the moon. It could drop right to the floor. It's I still see it as the single riskiest investment that's out there, but it's exciting to watch. And it's, it's like you said, there are so many different competing ideologies and uh, they're different groups. But what we don't have is a unified understanding what Bitcoin is, what it should be. Uh, it's the core core groups are at odds with each other, with uh, the core developers against the miners and the people that are coming in that are new to the market. They don't understand. I mean, do you, uh, I'm having trouble keeping up with this. And, you know, I live I live in the cryptoverse, you know? Yeah. Yeah, like, well, one thing I have noticed in recent weeks is that non-Bitcoin cryptocurrencies have been rising more than Bitcoin. So people see, oh, Bitcoin's up to 8,000. Oh, it's up to 9,000. But they probably don't realize that just because it goes up in increments of 1,000, its growth is actually reducing. Um, because if you were to start the year off Bitcoin at $1,000 and end the year on 10,000, wow, like, that, that's a that's a... 10 times return. But then in order to maintain that return, that would mean that in 2018, if it starts off at 10,000, it would have to end at 100,000 in order to maintain the type of growth that we've seen in 2017. And I don't think people realize that actually it's all the other cryptocurrencies that have been gaining a lot of growth, like maybe 30%, 40% in the last two or three weeks alone. And I think that's because people are moving away, like those involved in the cryptocurrency world are moving away from Bitcoin because they can see these risks growing. And because Bitcoin's like an entry point for many people who don't know much about cryptocurrency, they can just buy it on Coinbase, for example, and they're getting all these new users and they all help maintain the price. But I'm starting to wonder, are all the people in the know who understand cryptocurrency, like they're just taking that Bitcoin and converting it into other cryptocurrencies that have more return and a lot of these other cryptocurrencies are, are more functional they're less seen as 
investments, they're seen as more as, okay, they're part of a operating system, you know, but like Ethereum, which has grown 50%, I think in two weeks, uh-huh. we're, seeing, we're seeing that a lot of these other cryptocurrencies that are more functional, that they're starting to grow because I think people are realizing, it, it, you know, we should value the technology more than maybe a, a cryptocurrency that people just buy and hold. Like what, what is Bitcoin at the end of the day, if people just buy and hold it and, you know, it's effect via Ponzi scheme. Whereas if, if people are buying or investing into like Ethereum it, and it's because, well, they're, they're either buying into Ethereum or they're actually using operating systems that require Ethereum tokens and those token prices are therefore increasing because it's been used more, people may be thinking, yeah, like we should be buying currencies where it's actually being used. Remember Bitcoin, I, I remember seeing this on Twitter, people were saying, don't spend your twi- don't spend your Bitcoin on Black Friday deals. A good Bitcoin investor does not touch their Bitcoin. And all I can think of is like, what, like, what game are we playing here? Like with Bitcoin, why is it that we have to encourage people to buy and hold? Uh, that's very true. Uh, I do want to to bring in sort of the counterpoint, which is that there are a lot of businesses that have built themselves on Bitcoin. Even if it's not directly usable by a user, you've got a number of service providers that use Bitcoin as a base. You have lending platforms. We've interviewed a few people who, who have used it. The question, of course, is, you know, is that the main focus and the main reason that the price is going up? And I doubt it. It's more the, the reason people are aware of it, perhaps. Um, but it's, uh, I think that there is definitely a distinction to be made there between something that's a pure buy and hold token uh, uh, that has absolutely no use and, and Bitcoin, which is the grandfather of them. And for that reason, they do have a number of businesses that have built successfully on top of the platform. I often think about th- those type of companies, those lending companies. And yeah, like we the, had Radoslav on a few yeah, weeks exactly. ago. Yeah, right? exactly. And one thing that maybe you should ask him, Nathan, is has he considered moving to Bitcoin Cash? Because he uses Bitcoin uh, practically in the form of lending. But the thing is that if Bitcoin transaction fees are increasing, you know, is it in his interest to be using that anymore? Would he not go to Bitcoin Cash? And I'm wondering, for it'd be great to hear his perspective on something like this. I do know that uh, because he is a regulated financial entity, uh, it's probably more difficult than than for a startup to uh, to move or change cryptocurrencies uh, because of the the oversight. Yeah, I mean, obviously, if things get unprofitable, then you have to make changes. But it'd be interesting to see sort of his take on that. I should uh, I should yeah. ask him next time I see him. Uh, did you notice, uh, I just want to swap the subject a little bit. Did you notice a couple of weeks ago, that we had the first successful Bitcoin Litecoin cross chain transaction. Yeah, that was very interesting. I, I wanted to just bring this up briefly because I mean, I lament a lot, Neil, and, and I know that I lament a lot that everyone is coming in to buy crypto, buy Bitcoin, and they're, and it's hard to know sort of what's going on, what the limitations of the platform are, uh, uh, unless you sort of live and breathe it. And uh, what I found interesting about this first cross-chain swap is that this is hard to do. You know, if you wanted, uh, if you ha- want to exchange your Bitcoin for Litecoin, for example, um, it, it, what you have to do is you have to trust a third party. You give a third party your Bitcoin. Someone else gives that third party the Litecoin, and then that third party will transfer them to you other the only other way to do it is uh i i could give you my bitcoin and then you could give me your litecoin afterwards or you give me your litecoin i give you my bitcoin before but if that happens there's nothing stopping you from running away after uh, uh, i've transferred my bitcoin or me from running away after you've transferred your litecoin so there's there is a trust model there it makes it very difficult and the reason it's difficult is because litecoin and bitcoin are two different chains they're two different blockchains that don't talk to each other well i mean litecoin started as a fork of bitcoin but they're different enough now that 
they they can't communicate directly. And so the idea of creating sort of a computer program entity that can do what's called an atomic swap is very interesting. So what this would do essentially is lock your Bitcoin on the Bitcoin network, lock the other person's Litecoin on the Litecoin network, and when both were confirmed to be locked and available, make the swap automatically without a third party. I wouldn't have to transfer my Bitcoin to someone else's wallet. They wouldn't get my keys. I wouldn't have to trust them. It would just be locked for the uh, for the transaction. And if the other person just leaves, then it w- the transaction wouldn't happen. I wouldn't lose my Bitcoin. They wouldn't lose their Litecoin. So I don't know. I find that really interesting that they've made that happen. Probably the reason they started with Bitcoin and Litecoin is because the chains are similar, because Litecoin started as a Bitcoin fork. But these are the things that are going to have to happen going forward if we are going to see more and more uh, integration of crypto, uh, more and more uses uh, of crypto, and more importantly, uh, more efficient uh, exchanges. And uh, what I find interesting about this as well is that it does reduce the dependence on exchanges because there are hundreds of them and they're all offering different prices, different trading pairs, and it's hard for a newcomer to know what to do, how you, how they can make these trans, uh, transfers. So, Yeah, it, 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 it's an interesting space to watch because technologically, it's awesome. But... Mm. The use case uh, opportunities short term, I don't think there's many out there. Because if you think about the exchange use case that you mentioned, I think that will become more useful when a lot of these exchanges consolidate and we have maybe three or four big players. You know, no different to the stock markets of today. There are not that many stock markets. Uh, when you have like hundreds of exchanges, um, it I don't think, you know, the investment is worth it for an exchange to do something like this. And considering the fact that your many exchanges handle maybe 20, 40 cryptocurrencies, to be able to do that with all of them would could take years to develop. So I, I'm sure it, it, it's kind of like a great starting point. And I'm very curious to see where it grows. But um, I think short term, I don't think we'll hear much about it. I think it could be maybe 10 years away from being something that we become integrated into the cryptocurrency world. Well, let me just think out loud here about a group that might want to do this. Now, imagine you had a lot of money, but if you wanted to make your money off of arbitrage, off of rapid trading, off of automatic trading off of looking at the the prices with a computer algorithm, the way that stocks are day traded today. It's actually really difficult to do that. And being able to do atomic swaps like this, where you don't have to make three transactions or four transactions, a transaction to the exchange, another transaction to the exchange, and then two transactions back, well, that can increase the efficiency enough where, uh, where automated day trading companies become viable. So I I don't know. I don't think we're as far off as you think, just because there's that pull there. Yeah. It's like if you were to do it for your own gain in terms of arbitrage and you had a couple of million lying around (laughs) to, to, to do something like this. Yeah. Like that's a huge, huge opportunity. Um, but at the same time, this, this uh, could be one of the, I guess, problems we see in cryptocurrencies is that, and we see, I see this complaint a lot of the time on YouTube, is where people talk about spoofy. They talk about these big whales may, you know, manipulating the market because mm-hmm. they have more capital. They have all of these algorithms doing all of the computations and stuff like this. And um, the, it, it's when it becomes a very muddled area because... As, as much as people don't like regulation out there and they're libertarian and they, you know, and they're, you know, taking on cryptocurrency because it matches their values. At the end of the day, if you are 
if you're a normal person with not a, not a lot of capital, you know, these, these markets could really take you to the cleaners. Uh, because absolutely, and and so and so, this is the thing. It's like on the technology side, it's great, but as a common investor, um, it's probably not so great long term. Oh, absolutely um, not. I completely agree with yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. So so yeah, I'd I just curious. know that if I were a hedge fund, I would be dumping money into this to try and get it done before any any regulation caught up with me. Yeah. And if any hedge funds are listening to me and want to dump piles of money on my lap, I'll see if I can make this happen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But yeah, I, I think uh, like I was probably thinking too much inside the box. But yeah, this outside box thinking for a hedge fund could be uh, incredible, but also dangerous at the same time. Oh, for sure. But I mean, I, this is the thing is that there's so much developments going so fast with everything crypto that it's impossible to think through all of the unintended outcomes. And uh, that's why that's why I find it so fascinating to look at what the what the developments are and just sort of think, OK, well, what could be going on here that we haven't thought about yet? What could this lead to? And and that's that's what's going to be exciting about uh, the coming months and uh, coming years. Uh, seeing what the second and third generation crypto um, crypto projects are going to be, what builds on top of what's already here, and how is that going to affect uh, affect the market overall? Yeah, it's like crypto is the ultimate sandbox. If you look at social media and how it's been hacked at the moment, and then when we look at the crypto land. Um, it it's kind of been hacked a lot, but it kind of becomes stronger for it. It's, it's still very young and it's learning. And, and as we said about Bitcoin and how it can be forked multiple times and, and stuff like this, like people learn from that. People realize, okay, this is, a, this is an opportunity. It's a gap. It's a flaw. You know, if we can fix this, we can become stronger. And the, the, the thing about cryptocurrency, because there's so much capital involved, there's so many scenarios out there that, you, that that where you can be vulnerable. Like people are trying to think of them all, and because of that, you become exposed to these problems um, head on, and you're having to come up with solutions to beat them. And this is the this is what's so unique about this whole world. And I think when it becomes more mainstream, it's going to be such a robust entity that uh, it really does have a big opportunity for world domination. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Well, we should wrap up here, Neil. Um, I wanted to let everyone know, first of all, that uh, everyone should visit our webpage, uh, analysisinchains.com, and sign up for our Slack. We've had a lot of people sign up in the past while. We've had some really good conversations with uh, uh, with our listeners about how uh, how how uh, future shows should go about discussions about past shows what's going on it's uh, it's really quite a good community that's developing there and uh, for everyone who joins we'll give you some of the best cryptocurrency the Neil and Nathan nutshells uh, for joining I also wanted to just mention I, I I'm I, did I tell you this Neil I'm doing an experiment oh. I am organizing live meetups oh cool. Yeah, yeah. So I figure the next uh, sort of step is to try and record a couple of interviews uh, live. Uh, I'm attempting to get one uh, organized for December. I've got a speaker to interview for a fireside chat. Uh, I've got a potential location just trying to nail down the exact date. So uh, it's going to be in Berlin and we'll see how it goes. So uh, look for that. In uh, We'll have further announcements when things are uh, finalized. Did you have any announcements to do before we sign off? I'm good. I just want to announce it's very, very cold in Montreal. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. All right, everyone. Have a great week. We'll talk to you guys later. That's our show. Thanks for tuning in to Analysis and Chains with Nathan and Neil. Check us out at analysisandchains.com on iTunes, Podbean, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Until next time, keep hashing. Yeah.